All right, folks, welcome back to the Fitz News Studio, a big week in review. We've got a ton of judicial corruption news to cover, not only a new incident which perfectly encapsulates everything that's wrong with our system, but we're going to update you on efforts to fix it, including some efforts by a prominent solicitor and an influential up-and-coming state lawmaker. Beyond that, we're going to dive into the Murdoch murders, where did the money go question. This has been one of the biggest looming questions in the aftermath of that double homicide trial, where did Alec Murdoch spend all of his money? We think we may have an answer. And Jen Wood, our research director, and I are going to sit down and talk about that. Beyond that, I'm going to sit down with our director of special projects, Dylan Nolan, and talk about the Greg Leon trial. And if this is the first time you're hearing those words, Greg Leon trial, buckle up. This is a huge case. It involves a prominent local restaurant owner who owns multiple Mexican restaurants, his wife who was having an affair with an alleged gang member, and it ended in murder. That trial starting this coming week, and we're going to tell you all about it. And Dylan and I are going to talk about what's next in that story. All that and much more heading your way on the Week in Review. So last summer, I wrote an article about the investiture ceremony of a judge in Orangeburg County, South Carolina, named Heath Preston Taylor. Now, Taylor was screened out by a handful of lawyer legislators, was voted on, by the legislature and was installed in his position. But shortly after he was officially robed, a reception was held for him at the law offices of Brad Hutto. And if you remember Brad Hutto, folks, he's the guy who represented accused teen rapist Bowen Turner, guy who was accused of raping three young girls over a period of a little over a year and a half back in 2018, 2019. Turner was given a sweetheart probation deal in connection with that because he was represented by Brad Hutto. Now, Hutto hosts a party for this brand new judge in his law offices. And of course, I point out this is a little too cozy for comfort, but I noted at the time that we were going to give Judge Taylor the benefit of the doubt. We were going to judge him by his decisions, not by this questionable coziness to one of the most prominent lawyer legislators in the South Carolina General Assembly. Well, didn't take long for Judge Taylor to show he's one of the gang folks. Didn't take him long to show he's part of the problem in South Carolina when it comes to violent offenders being treated favorably because of their connections to these powerful lawyer legislators. So what happened? Well, let's back up to March 11 of this year. On that day, an individual by the name of Lance Lewayne Cox down in Dorchester County, South Carolina, asked a former girlfriend out on a date. Now, the former girlfriend had some trepidation about going out with Cox again because there had been some issues in their relationship previously, but she agreed. But the date did not end well. In fact, according to police reports, it ended with Cox holding her hostage, setting her home on fire, and assaulting her with domestic violence of a high and aggravated nature. Now, these charges were filed, and again, there are some folks who have questioned this particular narrative. In fact, we've heard from sources who've indicated that we need to look into the victim in this case, and we're happy to do that. But it was decided by a judge that Cox should be granted a $90,000 bond on the charges he was facing. Now, what's not in dispute about any of this is that shortly after being issued this bond, Cox violated the conditions. He was told not to contact his alleged victim, but he decided instead to send her flowers and multiple text messages, again, clearly in violation of the judge's order. So the Office of South Carolina First Circuit Solicitor David Pascoe, who we're going to talk about a little bit later, moved to revoke Cox's bond, as they should have. He violated its terms. But for once in South Carolina's judicial system, something strange happened. A judge agreed, and a judge decided to hold Lance Lewayne Cox accountable for his actions. That judge, Maite Murphy, revoked his bond and sent Cox to the local detention center. So what happens next? Well, Cox is no dummy. He's been studying South Carolina's justice system, and he figured out pretty quickly that the best way to get your bond restored and get back out on the street is to ding, ding, ding hire a lawyer legislator. So not only did he hire a lawyer legislator, 
He hired the former chairman of the South Carolina Judiciary Committee, who is also, by the way, the husband of the judge that put him in jail. That's right. He hired Chris Murphy, an attorney from Dorchester, South Carolina, someone who, again, as we've repeatedly pointed out on this program, has been part of the problem with the way South Carolina's justice system works, or again, in this case, doesn't work. So again, if you've watched this show long enough, if you've followed this narrative about judicial corruption in South Carolina long enough, you know exactly what I'm about to tell you. You know exactly what's about to happen. After he hires Chris Murphy, Lance Wayne Cox gets a hearing in front of Judge Taylor, and sure enough, his bond is restored. He's released from prison. And I want to point a few things out. His bond was restored even though he admitted to violating its conditions, even though prosecutors and the victim in this case both said they did not believe he should be set free, that they feared for the safety of the victim in this case. Taylor also set him free with the knowledge that Cox has just recently attempted suicide because he's in a very bad place mentally, according to his attorney, Murphy. So let's let's get this straight. Violent accused offender who admitted to violating his bond, who was claimed to be suicidal. Yet this guy was turned out, turned loose, again, against the advice of the prosecutor and against the advice of the victim. And the only thing that I can see that would justify that sort of decision is Taylor being worried about a powerful legislator representing this guy and the consequences of what might happen if he doesn't toe the line. Do we know that this situation will turn into a tragedy? No. Although I wrote in my article about this just last week on fitznews.com to bookmark that page because it would be a miracle if it doesn't. But let's say it doesn't. Here's the problem. This sort of injustice happens every day in South Carolina courts every day because lawyer legislators have learned that the system can be rigged to their favor and the only thing there is to judge, the only thing there is to point the finger on is the perception. We can't prove that Taylor let this guy back on the street because of the improper influence exerted by this lawyer legislator. But it looks terrible. And the fact that it keeps happening again and again and again is eroding, and in fact, some would say has eroded, public faith in South Carolina's judicial branch. So I talked about Solicitor Pasco earlier. Let's talk a little bit about his efforts, because in addition to filing that motion to hold this violent criminal accountable on this bond issue, Pasco has been doing much bigger things. He's been attacking this issue on the statewide level. And just this past week, in his home county of Orangeburg County, he attended an event with two lawmakers, one of them The name you probably know very well, Joe White from Newberry, South Carolina, a freshman lawmaker, part of the Freedom Caucus. He has been aggressive in pushing for not only big-ticket, long-term judicial reform, changing our state's constitution, but trying to pass some laws right now in the immediate sense that can address some of the most glaring uh, inconsistencies in our justice system. But Pasco got together with Joe White for a hearing down in Orangeburg County. And at that hearing, an interesting recording was played. Pasco, as part of his PowerPoint presentation, has a recording from an interview that was conducted with powerful Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey back in 2020. And in that interview, Massey admitted, something we've known all along, that vote trading in these judicial races is a common occurrence. In fact, let's cut to that clip real quick. And there is a lot of vote swapping that goes on in the House mm-hmm. on that. Um, I don't. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't like the way that goes down. I, I, um, I don't. But I don't know how you. Um, I mean, that's a tough one to fix if you're going to have a legislature electing judges. Wow. Mm-hmm. But I mean, look. I mean, I'm I'm open on the on the the reform part. I mean, I'm open on having judges selected a different way. I mean, I'm I'm open on that. Um, it. Um, I mean, I don't want to do something that's going to make it worse. I don't want to do something that's going to make the, the the selection process 
more political and more subjective than what it already is. Now, to his credit, you can hear Massey saying on that tape that he doesn't agree with this process. But here's the problem. What is he, and more importantly, what are other legislative leaders doing to stop it? If you know there's a problem, if you know the system is corrupt, if you know it's rigged, what are you doing about it? And I think that was Pasco's point, even though, again, no one's accusing Senator Massey of being a part of that problem of rigging these races. His, it would appear, is a sin of omission. But there's a lot of that happening in South Carolina, not just on this issue either, on far too many issues. It's not just those exploiting the system. It's those who are standing by idly and doing nothing about it. Well, Joe White, folks, is not doing nothing about it. David Pasco is not doing nothing about it. Those two are standing up, they are being heard, and they are applying the pressure. In fact, they're applying it to their detriment because guess what? I spoke with Joe White this week, and he told me that lawmakers in Columbia stripped $300,000 out of the pocket of his local law enforcement because he was standing up to them on the issue of judicial reform. Imagine that, taking money out of local law enforcement because you're mad that a lawmaker is trying to stand up for public safety. That is the bizarro world that we've entered here in South Carolina when it comes to this issue, when those who are championing what is right are attacked and where they are penalized in a way that could hurt further the public safety in their districts. But White Pasco, they're continuing to push. And two others who are pushing, I want to bring them up because we sat down with them just this week. And you're going to see that full interview next week. I'm referring to Kevin Brackett, who is the 16th Circuit Solicitor up in York County, just below Charlotte, where a ton of crime, that Charlotte area, rife with crime, rife with fentanyl coming in, gang activity, some of that seeping over the border into South Carolina. But Solicitor Brackett and York County Sheriff Kevin Tolson, these gentlemen have been on the front line of this fight. And unlike far too many in this process, again, who are standing idly by, they are not. They are speaking out. In fact, here's an excerpt from my conversation with Kevin Brackett and Kevin Tolson. Probation is one of the biggest problems in criminal justice today because the message also went out to Triple P, stop revoking people. In that's 2010, yeah, that's us failing. We need to keep working with these folks and turn them around. Some folks aren't going to turn around. It's all carrot and no stick. They have to show them every once in a while you screw up, you're going to go to jail. But if that's not happening, then the message becomes, it's a paper tiger. The criminal justice system isn't anything to be afraid of. So these people who are getting put on probation now in 2010, this is Triple P stats off of their webpage, 2010, 36% of the people put on probation in York County were revoked. They failed. They did not succeed at probation and they had to go back to court. Now, 7%. So nobody's going to jail. They're going on probation. And no matter what they do, they're not getting revoked. So is that a five-fold almost? More than a five-fold? Absolutely. Wow. You, it's gone from more than one in three. And I'm guessing people revoked. haven't been five times better behaved over the last No, let me, let me tell you how bad this is. I sat in court and watched a probation violation. Uh, this is probably four or five years ago, before COVID. Probation brought a person in, and I only tuned in halfway through. I wasn't paying attention. I was there for something else. And I, I looked up halfway through like, wait a minute, what is, what's going on here? And then it ended, and I filled in the gaps afterwards, and I was like, that's incredible what just happened here. This woman was put on probation for stealing something. I don't know. She had $1,000 in restitution to pay. She was given a four-year sentence, and it was suspended on three years of probation. And she had to pay restitution. And once she paid restitution to the victim, if she completed it, she would be off probation. They processed her into probation after she pled guilty and out the door she went and they never saw her again. That was that. She was gone. Four years later, they issue a warrant for her and say, you know, we need to pick her up. She failed to comply with probation. Four years later, she comes back into court. They find her. They serve a warrant, arrest her, bring her into court. And they stand her up in front of the judge for the revocation. And the judge says to probation, What's your recommendation for this, uh, this defendant? Uh, what, 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 what's your recommendation for the revocation? How much time? And the probation agent looked at his feet and squirmed and tightened, you know, like, oh my God. 
we're recommending you just terminate the probation. In other words, no penalty, just end it. And the judge said, what? What's the basis for that? And the probation agent again, looking at his feet, looking up like, I don't know what to say, said, I think they believe that she would have served her time by now anyway, so they just feel like we should just go ahead and terminate it. So, and the courtroom is filled with people Victims. who are about to plead guilty, well, victims yeah. and defendants, who are about to plead guilty and get put on probation. And what was the message they received? You don't have to do a damn thing that this judge is about to tell you you have to do on probation. Folks, I want you to look for that full interview early next week on Fitz News as we continue to push this issue. I've said it once. I've said it again. I will say it a million times, enough times, until we get the change we need it. South Carolina's justice system is not working for you. It is working for a handful of powerful lawyer legislators. And until that changes, we will continue to see victims re-victimized. We will continue to see violent crime soar in this state. And most importantly, we will continue to see the public's trust and faith in the laws and the courts of this state continue to evaporate. Count on this news outlet to do everything we can to stop those things from happening. All right, so I'm with our research director, Jen Wood. Jen, you probably remember last November because you did a ton of research on Alec Murdoch and the checks that he was sending to cousin Eddie Smith, Curtis Eddie Smith, who was, again, a co-conspirator in that roadside shooting incident who's been implicated in the SLED drug investigation. But I wanted to go back to that story because we raised some points in that story that I think are very important to what we're getting ready to talk about. It talks about how back in the spring of 2021 that the walls were absolutely closing in on Alec Murdoch. But why? Why did he owe so much money? Who did he owe it to? And what did he owe it for? And I think those questions are starting to come, come into clearer focus this week, aren't they, Jen? Walk us through a little bit about, about what you've been able to find related to where that money may have gone. So we do have copies of the checks that Alec wrote to Eddie Smith, and they begin in March of 2015 and continue into 2021. But what I think I found most interesting was that they increased exponentially in 2020 and 2021. In 2021, they kind of got sloppy. So, you know, before they were structuring the checks so that they didn't, they didn't hit any of those, those red flag currency transaction reports, red flags that the banks do. In 2021, all that went out the window. The check amounts increased. Um, they went over that $10,000 threshold. There were multiple checks written in a day cashed in the same place. So, I mean, it something was definitely going on leading up to Maggie and Paul's murders. And Jen, I think you pointed out the, the acceleration of the amounts. There were, mm -hmm. I believe, $620,000 in checks in the right. half year leading up and over 130000 in the 30 days before the murders. Right. And I mean... Yeah, I mean, I think the walls were closing in on him relating to the money he had stolen from his clients. Um, but this is more the walls seem to have been closing in on him as to where that money he was giving to Eddie Smith was going. So, I well, mean, yeah, I mean, where did where did the money go? It's the big question. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because you've been following as as these various indictments have been issued and as we've been following the status update that happened earlier this year regarding the pending charges not only against Murdoch but against his co-conspirator Corey Fleming, Russell Lafitte, but there are also some other defendants tied to this and I wanted to talk briefly about them and some possible connections they may have to this and of course I'm talking about Jerry Rivers, Spencer mm -hmm. Roberts, Walk us through some of the allegations that we've heard related, particularly to Rivers, as it relates to the notion that some of this Murdoch money may have gone toward gambling. Right. So Jerry Rivers and Spencer Roberts, the first time we heard their name was, I mean, quite frankly, it seemed like by accident in August 2022 when they were indicting Alex 
and Eddie for additional charges. And it appears, I mean, during the indictments, they also indicted these two individuals and they were setting their bonds. And it appears as though they were connected in some way to whatever, whatever crime ring Eddie and Alex were involved in. Um, and their indictments were, you know, conspiracy related. Um, I'm looking at, um, and there was something, something that came after that that I thought was interesting. Um, another indictment where they, and we FOIA'd for the incident report for this, where they were, went to Jerry Rivers' home and um, that there was a gambling-related arrest. It was, you know, operation of a gambling home. He and was that, actually hit with five charges. Well, right, Correct. And that wasn't in the August indictment. So I thought that, I mean, was it drugs? Was Alex involved in the gambling? I mean, obviously these individuals were also involved in operating a gambling ring. And there was a cell phone that went missing that they were trying to hide in the process. I mean, there's just a lot of questions that yeah, go that along story, with these. That story that you found through that, that FOIA and getting that incident report, there were five gambling charges that were leveled against Rivers. Mm -hmm. And what we didn't know at the time was that those charges were filed against him after the local state law enforcement division raid. And the purpose of that raid was information related to Alec Murdoch. This was right after he'd been indicted for the murders. And as you mentioned, there was that cell phone that reportedly had evidence on it related to Murdoch's involvement with all these different entities and all these different characters. And that phone was disposed of, apparently, by Rivers. Right. Right. So what do we think was on that phone? It's a really <laughs> did good they ever question. Find it? I mean, that is a really good question. What was on that phone that they were so willing to get rid of it? And it sounds like he, they told him he has to give the phone up and he gave them another phone, not the phone that they yeah. were looking for. Yeah. He gave him something, but it wasn't the phone. They quickly determined it was not what they were looking for. And so they charged him with, uh, what was it? Obstruction of justice, I think. Correct. And that's the Did one he has the phone. That's I'll a good question. Phone. Speaking of phones, though, and speaking of, and we'll come back to Rivers in a moment, but speaking of phones, Jen, you noticed some things in the immediate aftermath of the double homicide trial, because our audience, of course, will recall that during the double homicide trial, one of the key elements of the state's case was that timeline, which they put together in just intricate detail based on phone logs, on vehicular logs, this huge timeline that was put together by SLED. Uh, that really zeroed in on how it really couldn't be anyone other than Alec Murdoch, or at least at the very least that Murdoch was certainly where he claimed he wasn't right at the time his wife and son were killed. But Jen, you dug deeper into that timeline and found some interesting names. Tell us a little bit about what you found when looking into that timeline and some of the stuff that SLED didn't release. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, the timeline to me was really interesting in what they included and what they didn't include. And they really focused on, you know, the day of the murder of Maggie and Paul Murdoch and the immediate days following the murder. And, you know, I noticed some names on there um, that kind of rang a red bell as for me as I, you know, I have been looking into the Cowboys and the gang activity in Colleton County for quite a bit of time. And, you know, not that these individuals are necessarily Cowboys, but the last names definitely were, were similar to what I was seeing in my research. Um, Kenneth Singleton and Dimitri Manigo um, both were individuals that had quite a bit of contact with Alex in the weeks leading up to the murders. And they were, they were included in the timeline report that SLED released. Um, he re received an incoming phone call from Dimitri Manigo. That call went to voicemail on June 7th. Um, he received a call from Kenneth Gregory Singleton. That call um, looks like it also went to voicemail. 
incoming text from Kenneth Singleton, call me, please. Now, those were actually the day of the murder. The day of the murder. And then there was another text um, from Alex Murdoch to Kenneth Singleton on the day of the murder at 1.12 p.m. that said, come to my office. I have you alone for 1750. Hmm. Which I thought was interesting because, I mean, it wasn't all, all of this wasn't in the timeline report. Now, Jen, you have also since identified there there is a connection. One of Manigo's relatives is connected to the Cowboys, uh, and you put you've done some geotagging and property record searches that would seem to indicate Singleton is at the least at least in close proximity to some right. Cowboy members. Right. I mean, so the, the gang activity in Colleton is is very. I mean, it's it's tied to certain neighborhoods. And and mm-hmm. these individuals are in those neighborhoods. And you know, Demetric Manigo at one point ran a social club in Yemasee, Um that I think is very interesting. Just, I mean, there's just a lot of interesting questions and a lot of things in that timeline report that I'm finding. You know, why why is there alone? Absolutely. And here's the other interesting thing with a case like this one that every single thread has been pulled and and examined to the infinite degree. Why has there been no scrutiny of of these individuals? And again, we're not saying they're gang members. We're simply saying that these are people that are having some frequent, and it would appear to be urgent interactions with Alec Murdoch on the day his wife and son died about money. Just seems worth at least investigating a bit further. And maybe law enforcement's doing that, but, um, But, Jen, we've been sort of not warned off of this story, but we've been discouraged a bit from pursuing this gambling lead, haven't we? Yeah. I mean, it's to me, you know, during the trial, uh, it came to light that well, somebody said that Alex had been spending $50,000 a week on drugs. And that was going primarily to to the cowboy gang with Eddie Smith as, you know, the intermediary. But that is a lot of money to be spending on drugs for personal consumption. It's, it's, I mean, we talked to one law enforcement officer and they said it's absolutely not possible. Is, is there a possibility there was also gambling going on? It, you know, it just, the, the amount of money doesn't make sense. Well, I also want to back up to March of this year, there's a publication, Gangster Report. And again, I've mm-hmm. become addicted to Gangster Report. <laughs> I feel like we've missed our calling at Fitz News. This is actually a very, uh, you know, give them credit. They're doing good work. But they filed a report back in March that took some of these gambling uh, allegations and insinuations regarding Murdoch one step further. That They actually reported that Rivers was – a muscle man for a gambling ring at Moselle that was actually right. operated by Alec Murdoch. And Jen, let, let me ask you this. When you saw that report, you talked about the, the red alarm bells or the red flags. I mean, what did that set off in your mind when you saw that report? I mean, I, I've got red flags all over. And, <laughs> you know, these guys are – clearly they were oper- operating a gambling operation in Colleton. I yeah, I mean, why wouldn't no, they do it at, at right. Moselle? Why wouldn't they do it at Moselle? I mean, I think Perfect that, place. Yeah, I do think that the trials of Jerry Rivers and Spencer Roberts, if they do end up actually going to trial and not settling, are going to be interesting. Well, one of those is actually scheduled. I think it's the Rivers trial scheduled for next month. Is that correct? Or I'm sorry. I believe uh, it's August. August, yep. August yep. that's correct, of, of this year. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Spencer Roberts' case scheduled for later in the year. But... Jen, as we discuss all these things, and and again, we've heard from multiple sources that are very close to the Murdoch money trail. And again, I don't want to go into too much detail, but they are people who are in a position to know. And I can say that they have begun to embrace this gambling theory in the last few weeks far more. uh, They begin to take it far more seriously than they have in the past. And so I also, as we talk about this, I want to point out there is an ongoing state Uh, law enforcement division drug investigation into Murdoch and his associates. There's obviously an ongoing investigation into the money. 
Uh, but I guess we're waiting to find out, will that investigation, which has clearly involved gambling arrests based on what you found in Colladin with that raid, right. is there a bigger gambling component to it? I think that's the big question, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've talked to other reporters. You know, we have relationships with other reporters covering this. I, you know, saying, am, am I crazy? And what I seeing? Cra- you know, I'm, I'm seeing this. I think this is a thing. And they're all like, no, we think it's a thing, too. Well, just an amazing potential wrinkle to that question that, again, everyone asks is where did that money go? Right. Because, you know, Jen, you and I, we we both, we've watched the conspiracy theory movies and we know that the who and the why, and, or, or the who, the what, the where, the when, that's kind of the, what everyone likes to focus on initially, but it's the why. And let's that talk really about matters. money laundering. A really good way to launder money is through gambling operations. Where'd the money go? Abs- Absolutely. And let's also not forget, as we talk about this potential connection, Jen Wood, it was your work back in the fall of 2021. And when you and I first started collaborating, it was your work that tied Alec Murdoch to former drug smuggler, uh, uh, Barrett Bowler, and, and the guy who originally owned Mazelle. So it's a property that mm-hmm. was rooted in that Mm -hmm. extra legal activity allegedly. And so certainly it wouldn't be a surprise to see a gambling component uh, stem from it. Had a runway in it. Had a runway in it. (laughs) Jen, you have been amazing on this story. Uh, We've had so many reports that filed under my name, under Dylan's name, under your name, but Jen, it's been your research at the heart of it. Cannot thank you for all your work on this and how deep you're digging into this question. Hopefully we'll get some answers soon, Jen. For my sanity alone. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So as I mentioned at the outset of the show, we've got a tremendously exciting case coming up this coming week. It's a case that we've covered at Fitz News in the past, but one which we are really going to focus on as it goes to trial this coming week. And I'm referring to the murder trial of prominent South Carolina restaurant owner, Greg Leon. Now, Greg is from San Jose de la Paz in Jalisco, Mexico. He's been a prominent member of the Midlands community for decades. But Dylan, this is a guy with a story. And not only does this guy have a story, this story of the murder he's been charged with, tremendously layered. Tremendously layered and involving players that I think you were just talking about in your last segment, people that our audience are going to be familiar with. South Carolina has a very small legal community. But Mr. Leon... uh, He's been a a vital part of the Midlands community. A lot of people know him. I think if you live in the Midlands region of South Carolina, you are certainly familiar with San Jose, and you probably have eaten there, and it's even likely that you have a favorite menu item there. I mean, it's it's definitely an institution in this part of the state. Guilty. What do you like? (laughs) I get the San Jose burritos, man. Yeah, that's what I got with you last time (laughs) we went there. It was very good. But uh, unfortunately, Mr. Leon has also had some run-ins with the law on multiple occasions. If you've lived in South Carolina for a while, you know that we have problems with our sheriffs. And he was right at the heart of exposing Lexington County's previous sheriff, taking a bribe, which he offered to him to release some of his undocumented migrant workers that he employed at his restaurant. But there have also been numerous allegations of uh, inappropriate labor conduct, withholding wages at some of the restaurants he managed and other restaurants managed by people in his family from the same town. If you didn't know, there's actually like around 700 Mexican restaurants across the southeast owned from different owned by different families who come from that region of Mexico. It, they're one of the most successful immigrant-run businesses from one group of people coming from one country, moving to another, uh, and then making all this business. His family still routinely goes back and forth to Mexico. Uh, and he owned a big house here in Lexington County where he raised horses. So it's a real success story, unfortunately punctuated by marital difficulties. Uh, It's alleged that a couple of days before the murder, his wife and the man who was murdered, or Churro Bravo, her lover, went to a Toyota dealership where with his money, not not Mr. Bravo's money, (laughs) uh, a new Toyota Tundra was purchased, about a $40,000 truck. And this was the truck that he was shot dead in three days later after Mr. Leon placed a GPS tracker in the truck, followed it to a a location off a highway, 378, kind of where 378 meets 20 if you live around here, um, opened the passenger door, and unfortunately the gentleman was only wearing his socks. 
uh, his, with his wife in the back seat. He pulls a handgun, fires four shots, two miss, two hit. Um, he leaves the scene, throws the gun in the woods, and a couple of hours later surrenders himself. He, he calls the police and says, I shot my wife's lover. We've heard that there were some, some moments where he was considering whether or not to turn himself in there. As it wasn't immediate, he didn't turn himself in at the scene, but eventually he did do the right thing and remand himself to the custody of Lexington's police. Mm -hmm. This unfortunately resulted in him going back to jail for the probation violation on the previous charge we just discussed. But this has been dragged out for years. This happened in 2016, Valentine's Day of 2016. We, we've talked in the Murdoch case about how it was an unusually speedy trial, and I think we're now seeing that because this is many of the same attorneys dealing with the same crime, murder, uh, but instead of it being turned around in just a couple of years, this has dragged on for now close to a decade. That's true, and it's finally going to trial starting on Monday of this coming week. And you mentioned earlier some familiar names our readers are going to be uh, uh, and our audience will be very well aware of Eric Bland represented uh, Greg Leon at one point. Uh, Dick Harpootlian. They very, were on the same side very, of this, by the way. Absolutely, together representing Greg Leon. However, it is Jack Swirling who was actually in our studio ahead of the Murdoch trial, arguably the the, the dean of the defense uh, lawyer community here in South Carolina, one of the most skilled attorneys in the state. He will be the one taking this case to trial next week. Now. Dylan, we spoke earlier this week with Swirling. He indicated that there were several evidentiary issues that need to be dealt with prior to the trial commencing. Do we have any sense of kind of what those are? Are we, are we trying to figure out exactly what may have led Leon? Obviously, we know he was tracking the vehicle. Right. We know he had a sense of what was happening. Right. I mean, is, does it get more cut and dry than that? What other evidentiary issues could there be? Well, it, it's interesting. He said... Yeah, he, he did it. He called the police and said, I shot my wife's lover. This is pretty simple. His defense is going to hinge on whether he can convince a jury that he did it for reasons that they find acceptable. Uh, if you look at filings from the defense, these were actually submitted by Dick Harpootley, and I think things have changed a little bit on who's fronting the defense team in the many years that this case has dragged on. But there are allegations that... Um, Mr. Leon's family was threatened, that Mr. Leon was threatened, that Mr. Leon's wife uh, was forced to perform sex acts. So these are very serious allegations. But also in the record uh, is a statement by the car dealer that his wife had indicated that she planned to run away with her lover in the near future. So it's going to be very interesting to see what is allowed to make it in front of the jury in just this normal stuff. But on top of that, the solicitor's office was worried that there might be witness tampering in this case, worried that Mr. Leon might be approaching witnesses, which, by the way, would be a violation of his $500,000 bond, which he was granted. So they asked the state law enforcement division and the office of the attorney general to investigate. Now, if you're not aware, the state law enforcement division, the attorney general, they have multiple statutorily defined purposes, one of which is to give law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies across the state the opportunity, should they feel they need it, to have an, an impartial law enforcement or prosecutorial organization come in and take over. And so that's what the solicitor did in this instance. And what they found led to criminal charges. And these are actually some of the same prosecutors that were involved in the Murdoch case as well. So it really is a small legal community here. On both sides, defense and prosecution. Dylan, you brought up an interesting point, though, about selling this jury on the notion that this was a justifiable homicide. And we were speaking early on in this story because there were some reverberations of this shooting back in Mexico where apparently some of those who were affiliated with Bravo, perhaps... The man who was murdered. The man who was murdered, who uh, Dick Harpulian accused in open court of being a, quote, violent gang member. But there were some discussions, apparently in Mexico, about retribution for Mr. Leon. But once the circumstances of the killing were made clear, it was deemed, and I quote, comprendida, or understood, permissible. So do you and think that's what it's going to come down to <laughs> is will a Lexington County jury find the killing to be comprendita? I mean, Dick Carputlian in in the Murdoch case made similar 
you know, he, he really went up there and stumped for his client. And he's been doing that to this point in this case. Mm-hmm. And he's got about the best defense representation that you can buy in this state. It's just is all going to come down to whether a jury f- sees it as comprendita. Mm-hmm. There's going to be these big decisions related to the perjury that we were just discussing. This is being handled completely separately of the murder charges and the murder investigation. The murder is coming from the local solicitor. The perjury, that's coming at the state level from Alan Wilson's uh, office of the attorney general. Two totally different charges, two totally different offices handling. The murder case is being tried by 11th Circuit solicitor Rick Hubbard. Correct. And he's no stranger. He's been involved in some incredibly high-profile cases during his time as a solicitor in Lexington County. Hubbard also very aggressive in his uh, efforts on these perjury charges with the attorney general's office. He appeared at that, at that court hearing uh, earlier this year, as a matter of fact, to call out what he deemed preferential treatment that Leon was receiving when he was allowed to remain free even after being charged with perjury while on bond for murder, which, by the way, took place while he was on probation for those charges we talked about earlier. So This is a classic South Carolina story <laughs> where a man that's on probation commits a murder, gets let back out on bond, is alleged to have committed uh, perjury, and is, by the way, still let out on bond. It doesn't get much more South Carolina than that. But I guess when it takes you almost a decade to try a case, you can't keep people in jail that whole time, or at least that's what their defense attorneys will say. And not without some justification there, Dylan. Um, Dylan, you did an amazing job covering the Lafitte trial in Charleston uh, last year, the first federal trial related to the Murdoch case. We were putting this ball in your hands for the next probably two weeks. It's budgeted for one week, but we've heard that this trial is definitely going to spill over into the second week. So, uh, Dylan Nolan, any predictions, projections, anything you're focused on as you get ready to cover this trial next week? Well, if this segment to this point hasn't already convinced our audience of this, obviously this is a layered case. There's, there's years of history here. There's people who feel very strongly on both sides of this. Uh, when, when Mr. Leon had his initial bond hearing, 75 people showed up to support him. I think there was only about a dozen people who showed up for the victim's family. So it's it's going to be interesting to see how the role of the public plays here. But over and above that, this case it has some of the state's best legal minds. They're, they're all going to be in this courtroom, and we're going to get to see them work. We're going to get to see them present facts. We're going to get to see them present evidence. And we'll see what's compelling, and we'll see what isn't. After almost a decade of waiting to finally get to this moment where a jury gets to hear this case, uh, I'll be very interested to see whether they find it comprendita. Well, Dylan's going to be interested to see that, but one thing I did want to point out, and this is very different from the Murdoch case where Judge Clifton Newman allowed Court TV to provide a live stream to all media outlets. In this case, Dylan, there will be no live stream. There will, in fact, be no recording inside the courtroom. We are limited to still pictures, uh, and obviously the, our de- descriptions of what we take through notes. So it's really kind of old school. Judge Walton McLeod really not allowing anywhere near the same level of public access to this trial that Judge Clifton Newman allowed. So that's going to make your reporting on this all the more important for people to follow, Dylan. Yeah, you know, I'm of the mind that there's there's cases where they involve children, they involve family court, uh, child sexual misconduct. That stuff should obviously no cameras be allowed. But I think that our state, it's high time that we have some sort of standardization of when video cameras are allowed in courtrooms and when audio recording is allowed in courtrooms because the public deserves to know what's happening in their courts of law. Absolutely. And in fact, our researcher, Jen Wood, has been doing some work on potential cameras in courtrooms across South Carolina, something that I've been talking about, something I think we need, particularly particularly in high-profile cases like this. Dylan Nolan, excited to watch you cover this case next week. Very excited to cover it. Thanks for being willing to dive in, and uh, we'll be looking forward to reports from Dylan Nolan on the Greg Leon murder case this coming week. All right, that is a wrap for this week's edition of the Week in Review. I want to thank Jen Wood and Dylan Nolan for their work and especially looking forward to Dylan Nolan's coverage of this upcoming trial we were just talking about. But by the way, why am I not going to be at the trial? Just a quick programming note. I'm not going to be at the trial because for the next two weeks, I will be on North Litchfield on the coast of South Carolina. You're probably thinking, boy, that sounds great. I'd love to have two weeks at the beach, but I can tell you folks, Chasing my seven children up and down the eastern seaboard is not exactly relaxing. It's not exactly the vacation that one would dream of. However, I will say this, I am very excited to get some time with my kids, 
we work hard here at Fitz News, and sometimes that does cut into family time. So I'm very much looking forward to spending some time with my kids over the next couple weeks. Dylan and Jen will be holding the fort down here. Again, keep it tuned to Fitz News. Dylan will be prepping a week in review, I'm told, for next week based on how things go with that Greg Leon trial. So we will continue to bring you those stories and more here on the Week in Review.